Hello, Shirley Adams for the Sewing Connection Series 17, Program 3. As a child, did you fold papers this way and that to create an animal or an airplane or something else surprising? Fabric can also be folded in unusual ways to produce unbelievable garments. This wasn't my original idea that I'm going to show you. A sewing friend in Texas, Judy Rand, told me about this, and the concept actually came over from Japan. It all hangs on the bias for a flattering fit, and once you catch on, the simplicity is amazing. It involves six squares, and their size determine the garment size. Actually, we've done some fabric origami before. Uh, on the mannequin, you see a bog coat. And uh, this is just a very simple concept. You just fold the fabric a couple of times and make a couple of cuts, and you've got a coat that easily. Of course, you finish it up with some other things, but it's very, very simple. And uh, that came from, and here you can see all the step-by-step -step instructions on the table, uh, how to fold it and how to cut it so that you end up with that same coat. That came from Series 9 is when we did that one. And you liked that so well, but you said, can we do it for a child? So of course we can do it for a child. In Series 12, we actually did this for a child. And uh, that also is just how you do it, uh, step by step. I called them heart warmers then. And it was warm a child, warm your heart. And thousands of these were made across the nation to donate to shelters or to schools or places where children might be in need of them. Here are a couple of examples of those little bog coats that you can make in about an hour for, oh, maybe $5 worth of fabric. Two, yard, or two feet of fabric is all that goes into these little things. So they're very quick and easy. But I had never heard of this one until recently that I'm going to show you. And this one, I think, is just magnificent. Now, it's perfect for fabric such as that that I have on. This is not the garment. But the fabric is similar in that it's a hand-woven fabric. And typically, when you have a hand-woven fabric, you want to use every bit of it. And you don't want to cut it up any more than you absolutely have to because it's very valuable and you want to use every bit of it. Now further, uh, when you uh, do something like this, you don't want to uh, waste any of it, of course. Well, nothing's wasted here. But also, some of these hand-woven fabrics are kind of narrow, and that makes it very suitable for this instead of the usual wide fabrics that you have. That bog coat, by the way, I'll show you. I'll refresh your memory. I've already folded down a little bit here. You fold it over here. You cut, I'll fold it the other way. You just cut it halfway to the center like this. Uh, you cut out the neckline and cut it down the front and you've got a coat. It's that simple once you fold the back over the sides like this. Here you go and here you go and there's the coat. All you need to do then is connect top and bottom here, sew it under the arms and everything works. So that's the idea of origami. It's going to be something very simple just folding whether it's paper or fabric. But what I said that we needed was six squares of this fabric, and they can all be together or they can be separate. So this might be a neat way to do some color blocking or maybe to use little precious samples that you have of this and that. It might even be good, you know, when you go into an upholstery an upholstery shop, they very often have oh, a stack of samples that they uh, are outdated or whatever, but they might be about 16, 18 inches square, and so this might be a good deal. Now, the ones that I have, the, one, the garment that I'll be showing you, is 16 inch square, and uh, it makes something that fits me, kind of a medium size. If you had bigger fabric, it would be for a larger size. Smaller would be, of course, for smaller size. But here's the idea. We have six squares, and I have numbered them one, two, three, four, five, six. Now notice that I drew another diagonal line here, right through square one. And uh, so since they're squares, it has to be the same amount of space this way as well as this way. You know, it's square. Okay. I, from corner to corner, have drawn this diagonal line, and so that I won't get confused, I put a one on each of these parts of square one. And then two is a whole one, three is a whole one, four do the same thing, a diagonal line from one corner to the other, so that you have uh, these two triangles is what it divides into. And then five and six are plain. So far, seem easy? Okay. 
do this in miniature paper form so that you get the concept in your mind and then you can do it in fabric. Now what we're going to do is cut off this corner, this number one here. We're going to cut it off and move it down here to six so that it looks like this. Okay, one is gone. It has moved down here to the other end of six. And so now it's shaped like a parallelogram. Uh, there are points there on both ends. And then we are going to cut four also on that diagonal line. So now we have two pieces of fabric. Now this is just great. Some of these handwoven fabrics are only like 16 or 18 or 20 inches wide. And so this works so perfectly for them because you have the selvages there that you can use. Sometimes they're very pretty and at least they don't ravel. And so that's nice. But Keep thinking how applicable this might be to some fabric you have. Okay, now we have it in two pieces. Uh, part of one through part of four. Part of four through five, six, but back to number one here. Okay, now what we want to do is just stack these. We want to put number one on top and number four on the bottom. Well, they're reversed on the other side, but we want to have them like this. And then we'd put a little tape on that so that we would hold it all together. But in the case of fabric, we're going to do a little sewing instead. So OK, we'll hold it all together now with this tape. So now we have back to one piece of fabric once we'd sew the fabric there. And so, so far, that's still easy. But how in the world are you going to wear that as a garment? We're going to wear it by turning it on the bias. And then with it on the bias, we're going to do some folding. And the way I have folded this, and I'll show you, it's turned the same way right now. I would never in a million years have thought of this concept, but some very clever person did. If you've ever looked at the birds and the animals and the flowers and so on that they do with paper origami, you can see that it's the same concept. Well, okay, here's how it is. Here's how it is folded. We're going to fold it diagonally right through five and three. So that would be a diagonal fold like this. I tried it going the other direction too, and it doesn't work. You want to fold it through three and five instead, because what happens if you fold it the other direction is you end up with funny points that don't work out right. This way it does. So OK, I'm folding this through three and five like this. Still doesn't look too wearable. OK, what I have hanging down here is part of number one. And that's going to go over like this. And oh, look, it's starting to look like something that could be on a body. And this number one, I'm going to fold under. And now it definitely is starting to look some, like something usable. Now what's neat about this is that what I have down at the bottom is all selvage. This is all straight. This came off one edge or the other, so it's all selvage. So you aren't going to have to do any finishing down there at all. It's finished already. So this is a quick garment also. Now we still have something to do about these sleeves that just come out here like wings. Well, they fold in a surprising way. This folds up so that these two edges come together. And that means it's no longer square, or these lines are no longer parallel. They kind of come down. They taper down toward the wrist. And then we've still got this funny little wing. Now remember, this edge along here is selvage also. This was the bottom. This was number four. It's a selvage edge. And so that being the case, this is going to be finished at the end of the sleeve. But I've still got this funny little wing. I'll fold it again. And it just joins the edge on the other side. So that's how that goes. And this one does the same way, but the reverse. It comes under and comes over. And here you have this neat little top. Don't you just love it? I thought, this is so clever. I've got to do this. And so let's go over to the machine, and I'll show you then how to do this in fabric. And I better take these along with me in case we need to refer to it. But uh, OK, here's what it looks like. And I've already progressed this far. I have done this in fabric. And I did have this narrow piece of handwoven fabric. I think maybe it was someone's trial sample. It has a couple of strange yarns in it and so on. But anyway, it was a narrow piece. So it was perfect for a project like this. But it wasn't enough, so I had to piece it. Well, what I have done as far as piecing it goes is uh, let me refer to my little thing. It is only. Square number, yes, just square number one. It's the one that hangs out here at the corner of each side. That's what I had to put. So I had enough of this uh, striped fabric 
for five squares. I just had to add square one, which then got uh, cut in half. So it has these two uh, ends down there that are dark. Now if you have to piece it, if you have to supplement it with another fabric, think what's going to be the most flattering on you. My first inclination was, I just had a little bit of this left over from another project I made a few series back, and I thought, well, that might be pretty. But if you look at it, what that does to have this lighter fabric out here at the sides is make you look a little thick through the waist, and maybe you don't want that look. So I thought, no, I won't use that after all. It's going to be more flattering to have those dark colors out here at the sides. So think it through and don't do anything too hasty. Once you've folded your paper so that you know what turns out, then you can figure what squares need to be what and which direction they need to go. So I'm not going to be using that. I do have some scrap left over, but it wasn't big enough for another square. It was too narrow because it was a funny shaped uh, remnant actually that I had. I had some yarns also that go nicely with this, so I like to gather together all the similar colors so that I can see what's going to go together and it gives me some creative ideas. It lets me know what direction I'm going if I just gather together whatever seems feasible. Okay, now I said that I had a 16 inch square. And what happens when you have this? This is medium size, remember. What happens with 16 is actually it's the diagonal of that that will be the size of your garment. And so this one here, I do have a ruler. Let me get it out. What happens when you have a 16 inch here is that you're going to have about 22 and a half going from point to point across that diagonal. So figure accordingly. Uh, this means that the whole garment would be 45 inches wide. So if that's enough for your bust area plus ease, because you don't want this fitted, it's supposed to be generously oversized. And so if this is, depending on the fabric, some fabrics you'd make larger, some smaller. But uh, anyway, 45 is what 16 will produce. If you do a 17, figure accordingly what that's going to do, or take a piece of paper and measure and see what's going to happen. So you can use any size squares you want. They can be as large or as small as you want. Just remember it's the diagonal measurement that will determine uh, how wide your garment will be when it's finished. Well, I've done this much and I don't have anything wearable yet. I think I have to have a neckline here so that my head can come out the top of it and I don't have that part yet and the reason I don't is because I still haven't quite decided what I'm going to do. I have a lot of choices at this point. I can if I want to, I have to cut a neckline of course, but I can cut a kind of a wide neckline if I'd like to and have a boat neck and just bind the edge and have it slip over. Now this is kind of warm uh, it's woolly, it's uh, wool and mohair, and it's kind of warm, and I don't know how much wear I'd get out of it if I'd make that warm a top that would just slip over. Uh, I could also zip it down either the front or the back, and of course just serge those edges first before you apply the zipper, because hand-woven fabric typically is going to uh, ravel considerably, so that would be another possibility. I could also just slit it right up the front to the neckline, and uh, then put uh, some binding on those edges, put a band on the two fronts so that I could put buttons and buttonholes there. And since everything looks like a jacket to me, that's probably what I'll do. Uh, but let me show you, before I uh, do any of that, let me show you how to attach this together because you have a lot of sewing to do. Well, not that much, but you do have to do some sewing. Now, what you would do first, as far as sewing goes, when you first cut that square four apart, when you first cut into it into two pieces and stack these top and bottom, immediately you will have to sew these pieces together right across here. So where you see that, let me fold it again so you can see where it is. It's like this. Here is this line, and that's where I stitched the whole thing together across here. Let's see, there, and it goes over here is how. That direction, back here. So you'll see this one doing the same way. It comes up here, and then we'll go out to that corner as it folds over. So that was my initial line, and I had to do that immediately. Now the way I chose to do this is to first of all run all these cut edges. Don't have to worry about the selvage edges. They're done, and they're going to form the bottom of the sleeve and the bottom of the garment. If you can, now my, the bottom of my garment is not a selvage edge because remember I had to use this supplementary fabric and so uh, it isn't uh, finished at all. I had to, uh, on mine, uh, do some surging there to keep it from raveling. Uh, but 
uh, what I can do is surge any of these cut parts that will ravel. Just go ahead and surge them. And if this is very stretchy fabric, it wouldn't be too bad an idea before you even cut it up, before you cut that diagonal here right at first, it wouldn't be a bad idea to run two lines or maybe four lines of stay stitching here before you cut it because that is diagonal, that's bias, and that's going to stretch out of shape very easily if you aren't careful about it. So you might do that first, then cut between the rows of stitching and then surge or zigzag the edge to finish them so that you won't have the raveling. And then uh, after I had all these edges surged, um, or here when you're doing this, you may have salvage and maybe you won't have to do that, but then you have some choices. Now if you really want seams there, you know, like 5 eighths or half inch seams or whatever, you have to do more than that, whatever the size square is. You have to add seam allowances to it. So you'd have to do some figuring and play with paper to figure exactly where those seam allowances need to go and make allowances for them, cut that extra on. If on the other hand you don't have any seam allowances, then you don't worry about it, it's just the size of the square. I chose to have no seam allowances. So what happens on the inside of this, and you can see uh, over here, I have just butted together just so that they touch each other, uh, the raw edges after I had them surge, so they're no longer raw, they won't ravel, but I've just touched them together and zigzagged the two in the machine. And then to really, and it doesn't look too pretty, so to really hold them securely and also to give it a prettier look, then I have uh, stitched this strip of suede over the top to cover it. Now that's a good idea on this anyway because I, there was no way I could make these stripes match and so it was a good idea to just cover it to distract from it. If you have completely separate squares, there's no reason why you couldn't if they're striped also. Put one on one uh, line and one the other direction. That way you won't have to do any matching because where it comes together, the stripes will never go in the same direction. So think it all through on paper and it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to do this on lined a notebook paper so that you could see where stripes are going if you want to do this in stripes just to make the job easy and to get it in your head whatever it is that you're trying to figure it out. Okay well anyway this is what I did first to this big long line that uh, before I ever fold it up I first of all zigzagged it and then immediately I put this on because that's the easiest time to put it on when it's still flat. And then you need to do some other sewing and think how it's best to do this other sewing. For instance, this one as the side folds around to the front and as the front folds around to the back, those would be easier to do probably if you start at the lower edge and zigzag up to or stitch seams either way up to the underarm area. That would probably be the easiest way to do it. You always figure the most um, beneficial, whatever you can do most easily. And if you start at that big open edge and go to this smaller area, of course it's going to be easier. Now as far as the sleeves go beyond that then, uh, oh and let me back up. At the same time I did all the zigzagging just to make sure it's secure because I'm going to manipulate this a lot. I immediately put the pieces of suede over that so that I could secure it and strengthen it and reinforce it and uh, get it together right away. That's the easiest time to do it. And then I went on to the sleeves. Now this is the more difficult part. It's kind of like uh, oh, spiral uh, piecing, those of you who are quilters, kind of that technique in that uh, we're going round and round a fabric actually. And so you need to go up to here and then you need to come on out to the edge of the sleeve. Now notice how much smaller the edge of the sleeve gets than it is up here in the underarm area, right where your arm and body connect. Therefore it would probably be easier to start here and work out this way. And as you come out here, just work your way around as it spirals here. So it isn't too difficult, but it takes a little time. Now what can happen is that stretching, as I said, because these will be diagonal lines that you're stitching. This is a diagonal, that's straight, that it's going to be stitched to. So I think it's not a bad idea to do something to ensure that it's going to work out just right. And this is the something that I would probably do. In the body of it, what I did when I was pinning this together, and I didn't finish this one, it's still to be done. So you can see it's just zigzagged. What I did in the body of it though, is just tuck a, a cutting mat inside the garment. And that way you can pin the two edges together and you don't pin through to the back side of the garment. 
you have that hard surface inside. So that makes it handy. What you can do for the sleeve is to put maybe this uh, ruler inside just so that you have a hard surface in here to make it a little easier. But if I'd put this ruler inside it, then I could bring this around and make sure that I don't stretch anything out of place. I want this to come in just right. And this has been handled a little bit without being stitched, so it is slightly stretched. And what I have to figure is exactly where it's going to go. This point, I know, must go down there, so it's like this. Therefore, uh, I have just a little bit here to work in. But this would be the safe way to do it, to get these edges together. And then either chalk mark here and there, hash mark, in other words, so that you're sure it's going to fit once you start sewing. And I didn't get this quite, this isn't going to do it on this uh, very rugged fabric, so I won't do it that way. A second way of doing it is take these curved quilters pins and just pin it together all along. And that might be an easy way for you to do this, to get it together so it's just right, and to work in the extra fullness wherever there is some. And I'm going to push the ruler there so that it's under it, so that I do have a hard surface so that I can pin that easily. And just do a few more pins. Do as many of these as you need to. And I had, oh, a whole lot of this in when I stitched the other side because I wanted to make sure I eased in all that stretched out bias part. So put lots of pins in. Do it however you find easiest. After I have this completely pinned, I will then turn it over and uh, go ahead and get it way out to the point here so that the whole thing's finished on this side the same way as it is on the other. So you can see here that it was zigzagged together and then it was covered over with this suede. Now I haven't pressed anything. Right now that suede looks a little ripply. By the time I finish, I will press it all with steam iron to get it all in shape nicely. And you can see how it then just comes right out to the edge. And this edge is a selvage edge. Um, if you had a narrow fabric and it was selvage, I see mine is not. Mine is a surged edge because I had wider fabric, so I did have to cut it. I didn't have the selvage everywhere. I didn't have that benefit. OK, well, with this, I'm going to bind it with more of the same suede. And then, as I said, I still have to make a decision about the neckline. Now, as far as cutting this suede, a really good way to do it is to use uh, a rotary cutter, of course, to cut strips of that suede. Anytime I have curved lines, I'm going to cut it uh, on the crosswise because with suede, there is a little stretch on the crosswise and it curves around and or curves nicely. But if, if you have just straight lines as this is, then it doesn't matter which direction you cut it. There is no stretch in the lengthwise, but that's fine. You don't need any. Uh, what I really like to do this with is this cutter that is the blade uh, that stitched, the rotary blade that's stitched right on or that's attached right on this uh, ruler. And it makes it really easy. You'd probably fold this a couple of times and put it in there and do some cutting. And uh, you just decide how wide you want this to be. And I would put it, of course, on the straight so I could see how wide it is. And if I want it to be a half inch, I just make sure it's from the half inch mark up to the inch mark. And just go ahead and cut it like this. And it just cuts so easily in perfectly straight lines when it's all attached together. I really like the uh, way that works. Well, what this was all leading up to, I thought I was going to actually sew that for you, but I really won't have time. What it's all leading up to is something I have back here. I have this extremely expensive fabric that I was given as a gift. It is Japanese fabric. I have been puzzling over this for about two years and thinking, what in the world am I going to do with this? Because it costs so much that it can't have a mistake made. And I have done all sorts of little miniature things in paper thinking, oh, this might be a good idea or that might. I have a whole file of clippings from magazines that might be a good idea for this wonderful fabric, which is a reversible. And it looks different on both sides. The color changes, everything changes. Uh, it's too precious to do anything that's a mistake on it. Uh, when I hit upon this, when this idea was given to me, I thought, wonderful. That's what this will be. It will be a dressy top because it's beautiful silk. And it will just be over sort of a column, long dress probably. And it'll just hang loose and be a little below waist length. And I think it's going to be just scrumptious. So one day you will see me wear it. 
if I decide to just cover the edges with something, I might use this because it's miraculous what you can find on the market that seems to go together. Here I have a silky ribbon that's variegated and it goes into these same colors. So I could use this or I could use something else. I'm still collecting ideas because until my ideas are completely firmed up, I'm not going to risk anything and I'm therefore not going to touch it until that time. Uh, think of some other things you can use this for any kind of fabrics, knits, wovens, it's very useful. Well, that made me want to try something similar with other fabrics, but next time, let's stay in the Orient. Colorful Japanese fabrics will certainly brighten up some gray skies. Come join me then.